So I'm not going to say too much. I'm going to start with a little video. Some of you have seen this video, I guess. Uh, but I want you to look at it in a different way if you have seen it. Think of cyber when you see this video. It's four minutes. And this is really the basis for what I'm trying to get across here. Okay? I'm going to say up front, uh, this is Hackback and I am pro-Hackback. Now, there's only been a few talks on Hackback that we know of. Uh, this is the first one that's pro-Hackback that anybody knows of. Yeah. I'm also giving this presentation at the Air Force uh, Cyber Convention at the end of the month. Uh, and then also, I'm hoping that the Old Crows will accept it for their convention in November. I submitted it for that. So we'll see. Then I have some other... This is mostly going to go in military circles. Uh, I found so far that, uh, to be very frank, uh, the IT sec community tends to be anti-hackback. Uh, believe it or not, well, maybe not. This is probably easy to understand. The IC community, by the way, if I use acronyms you're not familiar with, IC is intelligence community. The intelligence community is against hackback. I think the reason they're against it is because they want to control the situation. And we're having lunch with Rob tomorrow. So I'm going to try to tell Rob on Friday, on Thursday, I'm going to make him a true believer before he goes back to NSA on, on uh, tomorrow night. So we'll see about that. But I find, on the other hand, the military overall tends to be pro-hackback. And the other group that tends to be pro-hackback is the AI community. So a lot of this deals with AI. The solution I'm proposing is, oh, i got to use my... Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I would have forgot, because usually I don't need to, because my voice is loud. Yeah. So, um, so the AI community tends to be, uh, at least with the solution I'm proposing, it's heavy AI. They tend to be pro-hackback uh, as well. So it's interesting the divide, the IT second, IC. Would you normally think of this community and the NSA agreeing on something? Okay, not too often, but this is something they do tend to agree on. Uh, DOD, you know, from the military perspective, it's really the sense that you military guys know that it's kinetic and you don't want kinetic. Okay, you guys don't want kinetic. You would rather have some other option. Okay, so this is an option relative to kinetic. And the AI community just seems to kind of get it. And they seem, and I guess they like the AI part of the solution because it is heavily AI. So let's see here. Your computer went, okay, here we go. All right, so we'll go ahead and start. And again, think of this in the context of cyber. It takes about 30 minutes for an intercontinental ballistic missile to reach its target. But we already know that. We face this threat every day. Go home, kiss our kids goodnight and return to work the next day, ready. There was a time when the threat of nuclear war was our nation's top concern. The Soviet Union had the head start in space, but we had the head start in the atomic race. We showed that when we had to, we'd be willing to use the world's most devastating weapon. But we also learned something from that experience. We would never want to do it again. Peace is our profession. That became our motto. And we've prevented major power conflict for the last 70 years. There were some close calls, but calmer heads prevailed. And in 1991, we won the Cold War. Deterrence paid off. There were talks of peace reducing nuclear arms and a change of pace for military operations. In some ways, things did change. We became the global power that, that other nations sought for help, but we were not the world's only nuclear power. It didn't take long for us to see that to keep America and her allies safe, deterrence had to remain a national priority. And that's where we come in. The threats of today and tomorrow are no longer defined between two superpowers. They're dispersed across the globe, challenging us in all domains. We see unstable nuclear powers, terrorist nation states, and rogue fighters looking to disrupt our way of life. 
America and her allies are relying on us to figure out the best way to navigate the 21st century. It won't be easy, but we live and breathe what is hard, impossible even, and we succeed. Our commitment to the greatest responsibility will not be matched. Our advocacy for missile defense and electronic warfare, our expertise in the cyber domain, our integration in space, if our nation calls, our combat ready forces are able to strike with a decisive response beneath the sea, underground, in the sky, above the earth, or across computer networks, all ready to ensure the free world remains free. Although our capabilities remain unsurpassed, that's not what makes us so powerful. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and civilians of U.S. Strategic Command, we give our enemies pause. And our nation and allies peace of mind. Let's look to the future. As we continue to fight, as we continue to deter, always remember that peace is our profession. Video earlier this year. Oh, this. Stratcom uh, put this out earlier this year. You can see something there, right? Uh, if you're in the Kremlin or a Jungnan High, you're going to think you're going to think before you uh, start anything with the U.S. Okay, you're going to have at least a second thought. Clearly, in strategic warfare, we're prepared. The problem is, in cyber war, we're not. It's almost the complete opposite. So how do we get to having a credible deterrence? That's really the issue. We clearly have a credible deterrence in the strategic nuclear realm, okay? Again, if I was in Jungnan High, I wouldn't want to go up against us. How long have we been doing this, all right? But in cyber, are the Chinese afraid? Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Now, just if you saw David Sanger yesterday, he gave a presentation. It was pretty good. I liked it, actually. I highly recommend, as you know, this whole area is very hot. The idea of cyber war, uh, one of the best-selling books in the New York Times list, David Sanger's book. It's nonfiction. And also uh, Bill Clinton's book. I'm not necessarily the biggest Bill Clinton fan, but the book was a great book. I read both of these books in one sitting. And uh, But in Clinton's book, I could hear Clinton's voice. And the president in the book is brilliant. And you can hear Clinton's voice throughout reading the book. <laughs> he even gives like a little, a little lecture at the end. But I highly recommend both books. Because again, the idea of cyber war, the perfect weapon is cyber. And in Clinton's book, I'm not going to tell you what goes on because I don't want to spoil it for you. But we're talking about a war over cyber. This is the ex-president of the United States writing this book. This is not some hacker. What, you know what I mean? It's a fairly well-informed individual who still gets classified briefings writing this book. All right? And I'm sure he had help in it because the, technically it was very accurate. So I'm pretty sure Clinton had some help on it. But, uh, but you can see from that. Let's go on here. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to navigate. Okay, I need to go to the second chapter then. All right, so let's watch this.
video from the anti-hatback side. And I would argue that it, oh, right, sorry. Uh, and I would argue that the, um, the so this is, I, would, I, I actually titled this video ZDNet Paranoia. Um, and you see the flags falling down and so on. That's nonsensical. Okay, so some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today is really specific to China as an example. Uh, I've had 14 years in China. Uh, I belong to what we call a little secret society of people that have been in China even before Tiananmen. Uh, I've had a daughter born in China, a daughter raised in the Chinese educational system. Um, I was with Tsinghua. I was the vice president of the two, two of the five largest IT software firms in China. I was the only vice, out of 18 people, vice president level and above, I was the only one not born in China. Uh, so with Tsinghua, the software experience, I've had a lot of experiences, okay? Uh, and my network's pretty good within China. So, whoops, okay, let's go back there. Well, this is, that's fine. So that last one, actually, let me go back to that last one. A couple of these. Okay, so this one, the Atlantic Council. And here's some of my concerns. You see a lot of things that are coming out that really just don't make sense when it comes to China. Maybe they make sense with Russia. I'm not a Russian expert. I know nothing about Russia, okay? I'm not going to make any argument there. But in, And I consider Jay Healy to be a friend of mine. He's a Columbia. He's the first author listed. Uh, but they talk about, in this case, telling exactly what would be the response if we have a cyber conflict. That's exactly what you don't want to do with the Chinese, Okay, you don't. If you draw a red line for the Chinese and you blink, by the time you reopen your eyes, they'll be at the red line. Okay, so that doesn't work with the Chinese. That would be foolish to do. So that's one thing. I told Jay this too. And then Rand, who I normally have a lot of uh, respect for, they talk about a cyber Geneva convention putting limitations. So how difficult is it to verify a country developing cyber weapons. Basically, that's impossible, right? So we sign an agreement, we don't do it, you don't think the Chinese are gonna do it? You're crazy, okay? That's just ridiculous. So we have these kinds of issues to deal with. We gotta look at the reality of who we're dealing with. I don't think the Russians would follow it or the Iranians or the North Koreans either, but I can't totally speak to them. Let's go to the next one. So this is what was from uh, B-Sides last year. They may have done it this year as well. And this is what you see. You see things where it says, not cool. Oh, actually, I have a pointer here. Let's get out my little pointer. Okay. So notice what it says, not cool, damaging a computer. You know, <laughs> we got to look at what the real response options are. And then let's see if this is cool or not, okay? So that's from B-Sides. And then this is from a report, the, uh, I think it's inside the gray zone. It's a very, it's a, it's a good report. But notice also what it says. Again, higher impact, high risk. We've got to, again, look at the options. We're gonna go over the options. This is where I think this community is, honestly, is naive. Okay, they're, they're not looking at really what the options are. And now I can't see my arrow. Okay. Again, once again, you see what's considered aggressive, hackback. Is that really aggressive? Another one. Oh, and now look at this one. I thought this was funny. So this is like um, cumulative exposure and so on. I mean, these things are, this is what's going out from think tanks. And again, it's not really looking at the options. And here's why. Well, I'll get to, I, actually, I'll get to that in a second as to why. So, but the one thing you have to think about is, is that really the limitations on our options? It's not. Okay, so what are the concerns? I'm going to try to address all three. Now, really, we, we all know this is a multi-month discussion, right? Okay, this is not a 45-minute discussion, but I'm going to try to cover attribution, escalation, proportionality. Escalation in China, forget it. That's not an issue. Okay, and we'll go over why that's not an issue. Proportionality, that's tough. And we already know in cyber, that's really hard to measure. So what do you do? I have two oranges, you have a comb, but I have little hair. How much is that worth, right? So how do you deal with proportionality? Now, if I have two oranges and you have a Mercedes, we can kind of feel that, yeah, that's not accurate. You know, that's not equal. 
But some of these things in proportionality are tough to measure, but attribution is certainly a key area. Now, why is this not? Oh, next chapter probably. Okay, now we're going to come back to some other issues. Listen to this one. In open hearings, by the way, that our adversaries who use cyber attacks against us clearly see that the benefits of doing these kind of attacks outweigh uh, the costs, meaning that pretty, pretty uh, broad consensus that we, we really haven't retaliated hardly at all, whether it's um, Iran, North Korea, Russia, China. We had a hearing last year, about a year and a half ago, General Clapper was on his way out as DNI. He, he publicly stated in an open hearing that the Chinese uh, attack on the Office of Personnel Management, which stole, when they stole 22 million files of, I'm sure they stole yours and mine and others who had SF-86s, 22 million. And I asked him, did we retaliate against China? He said, no. No. So can you give me your thoughts on this? We seem to be the, you know, cyber punching bag of the world. And it's common knowledge. We, we have officials who have come before this committee in an open session saying, nope, we get hit and we don't retaliate. We don't retaliate against the Russians, the North Koreans, the Chinese. What's your thought on that? And should we start cranking up the costs of the cyber attacks on our nation? Senator, I'd offer three thoughts to your question. Uh, the first thought is a strategy, a doctrine, critical for us to be able to, to set the framework, not only for how we operate, but also as a message to our adversaries as well. The but second, do you think that we have that right now? What do you the, think our adversaries think right now? If you do a cyber attack on America, what's going to happen to them? So basically, uh, I would say right now, um, they do not um, think that much will happen to them. They don't fear us. They don't fear us. So is that good? It, okay. So this is some things that are in the press. The stuff I'm showing you, by the way, is all from the last two months. Okay, I didn't even have to dig back very deeply to find this material. So we have all sorts of things. Uh, that are going on. This is from the New York Times, I think, from Wired Magazine and so on. Uh, it's an issue. You can see it's an issue. Uh, we don't fight that. We don't do... Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, we don't fight back. We don't do anything about it. So we are the world cyber punching bag. And what do we do about it? This is one thing I thought was interesting in Senator Sullivan's comments. He obviously has security clearances, right? Remember, he has the FF86. But the way he's talking would kind of imply, I mean, tell me what you think, but I'm pretty sure the way he's talking would kind of imply that even if NSA is deep in the networks, it can shut off the Chinese or the Russians or whoever, it doesn't seem like that from the way he's talking. It doesn't seem like that. Because he would know better than to say what he's saying if he has, if it's true, if the NSA really is that deep in other networks. I don't think he would actually have said that. And certainly with his attitude and his tone, it seems like maybe we're not as deep as we may be led to believe. Um, and that's why he's saying that we're the world cyber punching bag. Let's continue. Thank you. Um, and one of the things that puzzles me is that while the government, in, in fact, the next month in, in October, uh, DNI uh, uh, went public with the fact that we knew all about, uh, we knew what the Russians were doing and people need to uh, pay attention to it, at least to some degree. The, this is what, this is a question I have for you, Mr. Daniel, and th this puzzles me. Um, there's a, a quote I want to read you from an article that appeared of what happened in late August uh, of 2016. At his morning staff meeting, Daniel matter-of-factly said to his team, it had to stop working on options to counter the Russian attack. Quote, we've been told to stand down. That's a quote from you. Daniel Prito, one of, Dan of uh, Daniel's top deputies recalled, quote, I was incredulous and in disbelief. It took me a moment to process. In my head, I was like, did I hear that correctly? End quote. Then Prito asked, quote, 
Why the hell are we standing down? Michael, can you help us understand? Question mark, end quote. Is that an accurate description of what happened? So that is an accurate rendering of the conversation at the staff meeting, but the uh, larger context is something that we can discuss in the, uh, in the classified session. Um, but I can say that um, there were many concerns about uh, the uh, widespread, how many people were involved in the, in the development of the options. And so the decision at that point was to neck down the number of people that were, uh, that were involved in developing uh, our ongoing response options. And um, it's not accurate to say that all activities ceased at that point. What about your uh, area of supervision? Did it completely cease as far as that was concerned? No, we shifted our focus uh, in that September and October time frame to focus heavily on better protecting and assist, assisting the states in better protecting uh, the electoral infrastructure and ensuring that we had as great a visibility as possible into what uh, the uh, Russians were doing and developing our uh, essentially an incident response plan for election day. And you've, and you've described that, but as far as your cyber response, you were told to stand down, is that correct? We were, uh, those actions were put on the back burner. Yes, we were, uh, and th that, was no that was not the focus of our activity during that, during that time period. Um, what cyber options did you recommend and which ones were taken and which ones were Rejected. So we, uh, again, this is actually something we'll have to discuss uh, in uh, the classified session, and I'm more than happy to uh, describe some of those uh, there. But it was the f a full range of potential actions where that we could use to uh, use our cyber capabilities to impose costs uh, on the Russians, both uh, openly uh, to demonstrate that we could do it, uh, as a deterrent and also uh, clandestinely uh, to disrupt their operations as well. Okay, so yeah, not at this time. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm slow learner, but I'm catching on. Okay, so here I am with Jay Healy, who wrote the first report, Max Meets. Uh, Max and I are writing uh, some articles for the uh, service journals, uh, starting with the Air Force. And then there's Michael Daniel on the right side. So, uh, so we talked about this. We're at the NATO CyberCon, uh, Cyber, CyCon in, uh, in Tallinn a couple of months ago, and we talked about this issue. This is right after we had dinner at an art gallery restaurant, which I highly recommend. Um, we had a good time that night. So here's some responses from Michael, an email, and I got his permission to use these. Okay, these are all the things I have from emails and such have permission. So, uh, yeah, he had some interesting, I did, I did white out certain things that really aren't necessarily relevant. He gave me some tips if you ever testify before Congress, and I well, whited them out. <laughs> okay. Uh, but they were kind of funny. So I certainly believe that offensive cyber capabilities are part of the world, and we better figure out how to live with it. There's no going back on that, sure, or score. On Hackback, I just think that the vast majority of companies will never be competent enough to try it. For the handful that could be, we need to figure out how to license their activities so they don't end up causing more problems than they solve. Well, I'm going to address that. Okay? So although I'm pro-hackback, I'm not saying everybody should hack back. All right? There's within constraints. That's what I'm going to try to convince Rob Joyce of. Let's go to the next one. His follow-up letter, when I asked him, yeah, he's fine using that quote. I really believe that the right answer is not to let anyone and everyone uh, or what he said, so not to let, uh, hack, could hack back. We have to develop better connections between the government and the private sector on this score. And we have to remember that what's allowable for U.S. companies will have to be allowable for Russian, Chinese, and Iranian companies. Of course, they're already doing that, uh, something most people in the U.S. forget when they're discussing. Your hack back as a service, which is what I'm proposing, fits in with this concept. So Michael Daniel, Obama's cyber advisor, agrees with me. Okay, if we have certain companies that are allowed to conduct certain activities within certain parameters, which is what I'm proposing, for example, 
Well, I don't necessarily agree with his examples. I think that's a little too trivial, but still. Then it makes uh, the situation more manageable. And there would be information sharing requirements with the government so the government, so that the government would be prepared to deal with potential diplomatic fallout. And then we talked about some machine learning stuff, which I'm gonna keep secret. Uh, for things he's doing, it's more just for commercial reasons, because we're actually looking at some commercial things as well. But it's about machine learning. Okay, so here's Obama's cyber advisor agreeing with my proposal. Now, here's the issue. The issue is the IT sec community seems to think, oh, attacking and hacking back is so aggressive. Wrong, because you have to look at the options. That's the option. NATO doctrine says we can send a missile in response to a cyber attack. I'm sorry, but to me, a missile is a little bit more aggressive than a hackback. This is from the Whale Summit, September 2014. NATO doctrine. We can send a missile in response. You may not like that. I don't care. That's NATO doctrine. I'm not here to sell you on the doctrine. I'm here to deal with the problem. We have no deterrent. Everybody just does whatever they... If I was any other country that was in any adversarial position with the United States, why wouldn't I hack us? What's the downside? Tell me, what's the downside? Hack. And if I can't get military, you know what I might get? Commercial. I might get a new product feature for something, for ZTE, okay? Or Huawei, evil companies. Okay, so, um, so again, this is part of NATO doctrine. So don't argue whether it should be or shouldn't be unless you're a policy guy. This is our reality of what our options are. Now, how about this? Mattis, SecDef Mattis said, we can go nuclear if our infrastructure is taken out. I'm sorry, guys, but I think hackback is a lot less severe than a nuclear strike. What do you think? Okay, I think it's less than kinetic. So I'm viewing it this way. Sitting on our hands is not an option. Okay, that's not an option. And too many people in this community seem to think that's what we should just do. Let everybody rape and pillage us in cyberspace. Okay, that's not an option. But I want something between that and kinetic. And I believe hackback will fit that within the constraints I'm gonna put out. So too little, too late. So these are the typical things you deal with in the IT sec community. We're gonna have active defense and persistent engagement. Well, persistent engagement for a company? For the NSA, that's fine, right? That's their game. That's what they do every day. But that's not real realistic, the Lockheed Cyber Kill Chain. I gotta say Lockheed because it's patent. They actually have a trademark on that, uh, Cyber Kill Chain. Okay, but those are too little, too late in dealing with the issue at hand. Let's move. So I call it Go KEO. What do you think KEO stands for? <clears throat> Kinetic something is correct. Kinetic is the K. What's the uh, E and O? <clears throat> this is David's acronym. I should trademark this. Kinetic enema option. <laughs> okay. We're going to send a missile up their butt. Okay. So is that really what we want to do? Do we really want to go to that point? I think there's something in between, again, sitting on your hands and sending a missile. Let's hope there is, right? Let's hope there's something uh, besides that. Okay, so what I'm proposing, hack back as a service, but it won't be called that. It will be called active defense as a service because nobody would, has the guts to call it hack back as a service. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. And then I'm gonna tell you about, because you can't call 1-800-CYBERCOM and expect uh, them to respond in any timely fashion, right? They'll get back to you in three years. So, uh, you know, Cybercom's busy. Um, and it is good, I think, that Nakasone is the head of Cybercom and NSA. He's the first offensive guy to, uh, to actually be the head. So I think that's a good sign, but I'm not actually happy with the Stratcom situation versus Cybercom. That's another discussion, though. I'm more of a Stratcom guy. And the reason is Stratcom, what you saw the video. Stratcom is about what? Their whole mission is deterrence. They think, if you go to the Stratcom guys, every other thought out of their brain, if you can map it with an MRI, it would be deterrent. 
deterrence. Okay, that's the way they think. And the Cybercom and NSA guys, they don't think deterrence. They're thinking like, ooh, fight back, like a video game. Okay, I think the deterrence element is what we really need. So when they elevated Cybercom to, combatant, to a combatant command, and they took away a lot of what Stratcom has over that, I thought that was a mistake. But still, I do like Nakasone. So I think that was a great choice. So here's what I'm, and I say for illustrative purposes only, this is kind of what I'm proposing. You need a big, big, big government contractor who's used to taking orders from the Pentagon and the IC. Okay, Raytheon. Who are the other ones? Lockheed. Who else? BAE, BAE right. Who else? Northrop. Northrop. Yeah, Northrop, right. Who else? The next one would be Booz Allen. Those are the top five uh, in the defense contracting world that also are on the IT services side. So those are the, f the five that really can take orders. It could be smaller ones. It could be a Periton. It could be even a Splunk. Who knows? I think those companies, you know, with 5,000, 6,000 employees might be a little bit too small to do this. Raytheon, you know, five, 6,000 employees, they may not even have their headcount that accurate. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so they can do it. So it's, Ray it's, a, it's a Raytheon, a Raytheon type company combined with IBM Watson combined with DARPA. So looking at some AI based solutions to this, you can immediately think of what I'm talking about, right? We're not talking necessarily deep learning. We're talking expert systems, right? Because that way, the NSA and a lot of other people can buy off on it, okay? And there's escalation. So if something hits a certain level, they got to get approval, okay? And Raytheon knows how to get approval from the Pentagon, right? Or the IC. So that's what we're kind of proposing. That's what I'm kind of proposing here. So we'll go over some of that. Oh, by the way, I am meeting with the head of cyber at Raytheon at the Air Force uh, Cyber Convention, and we actually are gonna have dinner and talk about all this. So we'll see if Raytheon can get this thing going. And if, it, and if they do, uh, contact me, I'll let you know about job opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so. You got my email. Yeah, I do. Oh, I must be. Oh, okay. I also recognize that we are at the edge of the technological frontier for our nation. The future that the next director will face presents challenges and opportunities from rapid technological evolution, including machine learning, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing, as well as the growing capabilities of the technological industry. If confirmed, I know that a strong public-private partner will be needed to ensure this kind of country benefits from the leading egg technology being developed and implemented today and into the future. Okay, so before I do this montage here. Okay, so what Dr. Sony just said on AI, quantum, ML, you know, ML is part of AI and deep learning is part of ML. But, uh, but anyway, so these are the things they're looking at as solutions. Uh, so this is something that I'm actually proposing there. So right here, this is at the Ichikai conference that you see on the back of my t-shirt here. That was in Stockholm a few weeks ago. Uh, 8,000, mainly the world's leading AI researchers are here. We have the leading researchers in adversarial ML right here. We have uh, DIUX, DIUX, yeah, DIUX, not D-U-I-X. Uh, he's there in cyber. We have the head of, uh, of um, AI at the, Na uh, the Naval Research Lab. The guy in the far right with me, uh, Craig Noblock, he is probably the world's leading expert on knowledge graphs. He also can do work with the intelligence community, and you kind of can figure out what that means. And the guy who won the Nobel Prize uh, for AI this year, their equivalent is Millen Tamby right here. Uh, Jeff, some of you have met Jeff before. Uh, Jeff is the head of AI at IARPA, the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects group, uh, Vince at Duke, and uh, Miles at Oxford, and Sridhar at SRI and Adobe. So these are some of the leading researchers in the world in AI, and they're excited about working in cyber. There's a lot of interest, but out of 8,000 people, I would tell you there's maybe 20 of us at the conference that really are doing anything in cyber, but there's a lot of interest to do work in cyber. I will say this, the AI community realizes they know nothing about cyber. Unfortunately, the IT sec community thinks they understand AI and they don't. 
You know, I like to give this little quiz. If I said Yahshua to you, can you give me a response in less than one second? If I said, who are the two hottest universities in AI research? And if you can't answer those, I would say that the problem is you haven't been fully engaged with AI. You're missing what's happened primarily since 2008. You know what deep learning is at a very superficial level, perhaps, like Scientific American level, but you're not really engaged with the material. You might be the most brilliant person in the world, but you're just fundamentally not engaged. The analogy I would use is this. What would you say to somebody if they said to you, I know a lot about ancient Greek philosophy, but they haven't read Plato or Aristotle? <laughs> would you think they're really engaged? If you don't know Yahshua Benjo, if you don't know that it's University of Toronto and University of Montreal, which you would never guess, how are you fully engaged? You're missing out on a lot of the research, the hottest work that's being done in AI. So that's one of my concerns. A lot of this community will say they know AI, and I find that suspect. I will tell you this, at the AI Village, those presenters could answer those questions. I'm not sure the attendees could, but the presenters could answer that question. So it's looking at AI solutions. So let's take a look at some of the solutions. Oh, this one, before I do that. So uh, even looking at brain-computer interfaces, that's becoming a big area as well, and I'm going to this conference in Japan in October. So this is the, uh, this is the major cybernetics conference. So they're looking at, but they're having a hackathon, not like the goofy hackathons here. This is like a real academic, high-level hackathon uh, for brain-computer interfaces. So all sorts of things of that nature that are actually going on that we're kind of, de uh, kind of detached from. Notice IEEE has a magazine called IEEE Brain. Okay, now for those of you members of IEEE, you may not even know that. Okay, so there is a lot of interest in this. Uh, this is a report I do recommend. You can get a copy of the report there. I have the URL. But there's also, the good thing is also the commercial aspect of it. There's money driving this. If you look at these numbers, there's a lot of money being thrown at this stuff for AI, for DOD, and IC applications. So there is money. So, there, so it's not just like we're trying to do it to have a solution to fight back. There's money to be made. And that's usually a better driver, right? If somebody, if a Raytheon can make money at this, that's a good thing. And just a couple of books I was going to recommend because they're free. Uh, they're not the greatest books, but the IBM book I like better than the Silence book. But they're both free. The Silence book you can get on Kindle version. And then you can find, and then this one you can get from the IBM website. Okay? So if you're not familiar, uh, if you really kind of want to get up to date on how deep learning and machine learning can be used, uh, in security, these two books are good. And again, I like the IBM book a little bit better, but, but the other one from Silence is okay. All right, so let's go on to the next chapter. Whoops. Okay. Now we're going to watch some videos here. Introducing Watson for cybersecurity. Watson builds its corpus of knowledge by constantly ingesting information from data such as feeds, blogs, reports and advisories that it passes on the internet. It then constructs a security knowledge graph by identifying relationships between various entities along with supporting evidence and confidence ratings to find paths and links easily missed by humans. Let's look at how Watson investigates an offense in QRadar that consists of a proxy log and a suspicious downloaded file. QRadar Advisor first performs data mining in QRadar's enormous data lake and extracts observables from suspicious behavior related to the victim machine to perform threat discovery for Watson, which in turn taps into its vast corpus of knowledge. Watson then constructs the Threat Insights Graph and also uses reasoning to find additional insights and threat entities related to the original offense, such as malicious files, suspicious IP addresses, rogue entities and their relationships. QRadar Advisor then prunes this information to zero in on key insights and qualify the incident, identifying the root cause. Respond to threats with greater speed, scale and confidence. IBM Security. Now, before it goes on to the next one, uh, that's what we learned from the Cyber Grand Challenge.
So if you read the academic papers that came out, were mostly written by the Shellfish Group at Santa Barbara, uh, they said, if you look at the end, read, get to the end of the paper, um, it will say that the reality is humans should be augmenting this, the automation, the AI. It isn't the AI assisting us. The, we're getting so many attacks so quickly, so many things are going on. We're really the ones helping the AI. And I know that may be hard for people to accept, but this is the Shellfish Group. I'm not saying this. The Shellfish Group said that's one of their observations from the Cyber Grand Challenge. Okay, so let's go on with the with IBM here. Watson has the ability to connect the dots between various types of entities and relationships. You can correlate and look for the most relevant pieces of information that decisions need to be made about. You take a billion security events and you boil it down to 12 specific things that you need to look at. What Watson then brings to the table is the distilled human understanding that's most relevant to making those decisions about that boiled down list of things to look at. Security analysts are always fighting fires. Wouldn't it be nice if they could be a little proactive? How do you get to be proactive? You read. You learn. What are bad people doing? Oh, well, they're exploiting this vulnerability. What do you have to do? to fix that vulnerability. You run this patch. You change this configuration. Well, Watson's reading the same stuff. Watson is different from traditional systems in that it's not really programmed so much as taught. You teach it by example, distilling the understanding of human subject matter experts, but they're not doing it in the form of coding. They don't program it. They give it examples. And as they give it examples, and give it material to work on, it learns to become an expert like they are. When you bring a new domain of knowledge to Watson, you have to start with, what are the words? What's important? What's a virus? A virus is bad. Uh, what's malware? Well, it's like a virus. It's bad too. What's a worm? Well, it's a virus that moves, and so on. The process of teaching Watson cybersecurity, as with any other domain, has several elements to it. The collection of the, the body of knowledge, we call it the corpus, the human annotation, which is capturing subject matter experts' understanding of the field by having them look at snippets of documents and actually annotate the document by hand. Iteratively, you add to the body of knowledge, Watson becomes a subject matter expert. It uses those examples to teach itself so that it can then annotate many thousands or millions of documents of the same basic type that it was given examples for. Watson doesn't modify its own code. It modifies its knowledge and then leverages that knowledge to find answers you weren't expecting. It's designed to augment human intelligence. It doesn't replace people. It amplifies a person's ability to be a subject matter expert. The SOC analyst is in a tough situation right now. You have skyrocketing problems, an explosion of information that you could use and read and perhaps remember to try to attack those problems. And oh, by the way, you have to do all of that every day. Finally, there's a chance for the SOC analyst, for the security person who is struggling and drowning and giving up and quitting because they can't keep up. There's a chance. We are not going to stop the bad guys. We are not going to stop malware. Now we've got a new lever to keep up with the bad guys and maybe get ahead of them. I'm in discussions with Robert High, who runs the Watson Group for security. And, uh, oh, there's a couple of people that should have been here. So uh, we're going to see a little clip. The guy to my left, does anybody recognize him? Brian Pierce, he runs I2O at DARPA. So all the IT things run through him, CS things run through him. Okay, so he's the guy that runs it at DARPA, and we're gonna hear him on the next video. Our enhanced attribution program is addressing 
and the cyber deterrence concern of anonymity. This program aims to make transparent malicious cyber actions and individual cyber operator attribution through high fidelity visibility into many aspects of an attacker's activities. Our approach involves the correlation and fusion of data from a variety of sources, including commercial threat feeds, network IDS data, as well as NetFlow, to detect and characterize data tracks between an attacker and its target. This information can then be used to prepare a narrative for a convincing public attribution of a cyber attack. So DARPA has a lot of cool programs going on now. Uh, matter of fact, this week BAE announced they're working with DARPA on the chess program in cyber. That was a big announcement. By the way, something I forgot to mention, the German military, which tends to be very passive, has announced they're going to do offensive cyber. They just said, we're going out. We're tired of all this crap. We're going for it. Okay, and this is the generally passive German military. So this is just some examples of things that are going on. We'll, uh, we'll go through this kind of quickly, this part. So you can see with the human approach where we are today on some identifications. And again, you can see a, an AI-based system, but the humans are still fully in the loop, right? So they're still in the loop here. You can see the, the yellow is the human side. So some of the things they're working on, another, their hacks program uh, that they're also working on for identifying things. They have a lot of programs going on in the cyber area, okay? And then this one is one that's really interesting, the LWLL. That's learning with less labels. One of the problems with supervised learning is all the labels drive you nutty. Okay, you saw that earlier, trying to identify the labels. Um, this is one of their key programs now is to start doing uh, more uh, machine learning, unsupervised learning, and also it still could be supervised, but again with less labels to speed the process up. Notice what it says. By six or more orders of magnitude. Okay, that's pretty significant, right? Okay, one book I'm also going to recommend. There's even a book on AI strictly on cyber attribution. So before you start talking about what AI can and cannot do, engage with the material first. You may read it and say, well, here's the problem. That's fine. But engage with the materials before um, reacting to it. Okay, now we're on to China, my favorite part of the presentation. Okay. for obvious reasons, but I do want to talk about China. Um, do you, from, from your perspective and, and the things that you're looking at, do you Who see... Lester Holt. No, not that guy. <laughs> yes, we all know that's Lester Holt. Who's the guy with him? FBI director. Very good. Christopher Wray. Uh, and when is this? This is last month. China as an adversary, and if so, on what levels? Well, I think China, uh, from a counterintelligence perspective, in many ways represents the broadest, most challenging, most significant threat we face as a country. Uh, and I say that because for them, it is a whole of state effort. It is economic espionage as well as traditional espionage. It is non-traditional collectors as well as traditional intelligence operatives. It's human sources as well as cyber means. It, we have economic espionage investigations in every state, all 50 states that trace back to China. It covers everything from uh, corn seeds in Iowa to wind turbines in Massachusetts. Uh, and everything in between. Um, and so the volume of it, the pervasiveness of it, the significance of it uh, is something that I think this country cannot underestimate. Are they going after things, though, differently than, than for example, what you've been seeing with the Russians and our democratic process? They, it's a different, if it's a different kind of threat, obviously the Russia threat is a significant one that I think we need to deal with very aggressively indeed, but I, I think the China threat, uh, China is trying to position itself as the sole dominant superpower, the sole dominant economic power. They're trying to replace the United States in that role. 
Um, and so theirs is a long-term game that uh, is focused on, as I said, just about every industry, every quarter of society in many ways. It involves academia, it involves research and development, um, it involves everything from agriculture to high tech. Um, and so theirs is a, as I said, a more pervasive, a broader uh, approach, but in many ways more of a long-term threat to the um, but look, at the end of the day, uh, the Chinese fundamentally seek to replace the United States as the leading power in the world. Now, I say that where well, we wouldn't have said that 10, 15 years ago. Increasingly, the Chinese, let me be careful about this because terms are important. And what we're talking about, what we're not talking about. We're talking about this rising China under this leadership directed by this Communist Party of China. I say that with purpose because the Chinese will accuse commentary like this as being anti-China or anti-Chinese. The threat that China poses to U.S. national security, economic interests, political well-being, and the, and the international order we stand behind is not necessarily coming from the country itself, its rise, its contribution to international well-being, nor from the diaspora or the Chinese um, citizenry in general. It's under this leadership which increasingly um, has been aspiring, expanding its ambitions, its interests, its activities around the globe uh, to compete with the United States and at the end of the day to undermine our influence relative to their influence. Okay, so. That was, uh, you probably don't recognize him. He's the head of the East Asia desk at the Directorate of Intelligence at CIA. Okay, so... Uh, he kind of knows what he's talking about, too. And I think he actually missed one key point. It's not even about that. It's about this faction of the Communist Party. There are several factions of the Communist Party. There's five major factions. There's the Boshi Lai faction. There's the Communist Youth League faction. The Zhang Zemin faction. There's a former PLA faction. And now there's Xi Jinping's faction. That's the one in charge. So I would argue it's not even just this Communist Party. It's this faction of the Communist Party. Uh, life under Hu Jintao was different. It was getting more aggressive. It was. They were rising. The 2008 financial crisis gave them a chance to rise. Even though 60 Minutes said a lot of stupid things. By the way, if you're interested in China, the New York Times has the best coverage. The Guardian's pretty good, and the Globe and Mail's pretty good, too. Everything else, be suspicious. 60 Minutes is useless, stupid. They, maybe you saw the one on uh, the empty, the ghost towns in China. That's totally, and again, this is the problem with culture and understanding the Chinese. It's just like when I came back once to the, my, my doctors in Silicon Valley, because that's where I last came from before I went to China. And he asked me, well, about the antibiotics. He said, how come they don't regulate antibiotics in China? They don't. Anybody can buy antibiotics. He said, oh, that's bad from a public health point of view, this, that, and the other thing. Why is that not taking Chinese culture in consideration? Can anybody answer that? They don't take Western medicine unless they're dying or massively suffering. They won't, they look at antibiotics as like poison. So again, from our Western mindset, oh, that's bad, you should regulate antibiotics. I can give 50 boxes of antibiotics to Chinese and unless they're dying or massively suffering, they won't take them. So again, culture. I know you gotta look at these things from a, a cultural perspective and that's not what's uh, being considered. So here, we have some of the spying going on. We have the Army veteran. He was from the Defense Intelligence Agency on the right. Again, this is just from the last two months. Moving on, this is an interesting report from the RAND Corporation. We're going to look at a quote from it. If left unchecked, China's challenge could also result in the export of increasingly authoritarian values and shape an international order in which Beijing sets the terms of every deal, takes whatever intellectual property or resources it wants, and threatens those who resist with economic ruin and military force. That's a pretty strong statement. Okay? That's the world order you, your kids and your grandkids and great-grandkids are looking at if the current party in power, the faction, remains that way. That's the kind of future we're looking at, okay? Now, fortunately, the trade war has put a dent in this. I'm not talking about Trump, but I got to tell you, the trade war is one of the best things possible because in basic economics, the buyer has more control than the seller. And guess what? We're the buyer, 
But here's something the American media always, even guys like Krugman at the New York Times, fail to ever mention. China gets most of its profits from us. It isn't just about trade volume, it's profits. Secondarily, from the EU, if you take out those profits from China, they can't, even on a marginal cost basis, sell profitably to Africa or South America. This, and I can tell you they're feeling it already, and it barely started. Okay. Now, I, gotta, I totally agree those jobs are never coming back to America, but think this through. If we build plants in Vietnam, Indonesia, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, guess what happens? American companies build goodwill in those countries. Another advantage for us. Report I highly recommend, foreign economic espionage. You can imagine who gets top billion in this report. But it's not just China. It talks about, uh, this just came out a couple of months ago. Now, the last two months, Sensitive Navy, Navy program uh, data, that's with the submarines. It was submarine, I guess it was missiles as well as uh, strategies that they took. And hacking our satellites. Last two months. Okay, now in the area of AI, this is a little scary. This is actually the one post I had on LinkedIn that got the most hits I ever uh, ever had, over 10,000, 11,000 hits. So look at this in research. We normally tend to think of China as not being good in research. Uh, they tend to copy, they tend not to be. This is the web of science, so these are highly uh, cited journals, good journals. These are in English. And look, that China in highly cited uh, and in hot papers, out publishes all 29 NATO countries combined. Okay? Now remember, this is English language, highly cited journals, not crap shit that they publish in China. Okay? We're talking our journals. And that's what they're doing. Okay? So don't discount the Chinese research. I can tell you the Ichikai conference, there were Chinese everywhere. <laughs> okay, and I even did a search on our little web app we had for Ichikai. I typed in the word defense. One person showed up from Spay War, from San Diego, from our side. Four people from the Chinese National Defense University were on that list. Now, I admit, most of the people that showed up were from Tencent, Alibaba, places like that, which are less threatening to us. But still, you can see the level of research that's going on. We can't discount that. Now, why are we watching this? The reason we're watching this is you have to try to understand the mentality of the country we're dealing with. What are they actually doing to their own people? Uh, what's actually happening? To try to get a better understanding of where they're coming from. Uh, alt-right kind of publication, right? <laughs>
So we have DEFCON China, don't we? How stupid was that? Okay. Are we going to have, is Jeff going to announce tomorrow afternoon DEFCON Pyongyang? <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe he will. I understand that Baidu paid for it. So from a financial, that's my understanding. By the way, in China, oh, one second. It's, in China, it's marketed, it was marketed as DEFCON China by Baidu. So I think we should have DEF CON Las Vegas by Microsoft. What do you think? Okay. So, and again, I understand it's a, it's a low risk option for DT, but was that really the right option, the right thing to do? Notice the t-shirts that are going around here. What do they say? Disobey, right? On the t-shirts. Think they're going to have those in China, DEF CON China? I don't think so. I don't think those are going to fly. So I think we're compromising our values. This is an ethics talk, right? Are we compromising our values to just to try to make some money. Do we really think we're integrating with the Chinese community of hackers? We're not. Now, fortunately, there is some dissent. This is from a Tsinghua professor. This came out a few weeks ago. It's getting a lot of coverage. Uh, he actually talked about the idea, the idea of the two-term limit. As you know, Xi Jinping now is Emperor Xi Jinping. Uh, they changed the constitution, so there's no longer a two-term limit. Uh, my guess is, and I'm, you know, I'm not in, alone in this, in 2049, in the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party taking over, he will be 96 years old, and he wants global hegemony. He'll settle for regional hegemony, but he wants global. So that's what we're up against. That's what I believe, and many others think that we're up against that. Was uh, So he wrote an article, this Tsinghua professor, remember, that's their MIT. He wrote this article that attacks the two-term limit. I always remind the Chinese, who put in the two-term limit? America? How about Deng Xiaoping, the guy who made you rich? Okay, it's Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms that allow China to become rich. All right? But and he's the one that put in the two-term limits to avoid another Mao. Mao. It's not the West that said two-term limits. All right? So there is some dissent. We'll see how that works out. He's in Japan now uh, when he wrote this. And I don't think he's going back to China. Okay, so this is, um, this is funny. David Sanger's book, who was here yesterday, this is uh, something, I have the Kindle version, so I just did a screen capture. The Hackers, this is from 61398, that's their unit in Shanghai, the PLA unit for one of the key hacking units in China. The Hackers, just about all of them male and most in their mid-20s, carried on like a lot of young guys around the world. They showed up at work about 8.30, Shanghai time, checked a few sports scores, emailed their girlfriends, and occasionally watched porn. All right, that's DEF CON, right? That, that's, that's the same thing. There's no difference. Then when the clock struck nine, they started method, method, breaking into computer systems around the world, banging on the keyboards until a lunch break gave them a moment to go back to the scores, the girlfriends, and the porn. Now, why is this relevant? Unlike North Korea, Iran, and Russia, which may have nothing to lose in hacking against us, these kids in Shanghai live a good life. Okay? They don't want that life disrupted. They can leave the PLA and go work at Tencent and make more money. And actually, I think Hangzhou is better to live in anyway. Or that's Alibaba. So... Um, so they could do that. So the point is, again, the Chinese now, because of their economic wealth, they have things to lose that other countries may not have to lose. So we can put uh, some pressure on them, give them a cost for their hacking. Uh, as you may know, a few years ago, we indicted some members from 61398. CNN went there and, and, and watched them. 
even took video of some of the PLA members with their children. Okay, and that freaked them out. Plus, you can put internet red notices on them as well, so they can't travel. By the way, somebody, again, in the ITSEC community, who's another paranoid, we can't hack back kind of guy, he said, oh, if there's a hack back thing on Lockheed and they're running one of these companies, uh, he said, they'll put an internet red notice on them. Guess what would happen? The Chinese put an internet red notice on one of our guys that's doing hacking, and in the next morning, we arrest 1,000 Chinese for spying in the United States. Think China's going to give that up? Not a chance. Okay? They're not going to trade off that. There will be no internet red notices on any of us that are hacking back. They have way too much to lose. Think of the invisibility cloak from Harry Potter. They stole that from Duke. You may not even know about that. It's public knowledge. Okay? So that was taken. And there's so many spies. I mean, I know how to get rid of this student spying problem real easily. I want to talk to Christopher Ray. I'm going to tell Rob Joyce tomorrow to relay that to him. It would be easy to stop. Because they have too much to lose. They're now economically well off. So again, you have to think of what you have to think of the cultural considerations as well. Okay. Now Jan Kahlberg. There you go, Jan Kahlberg, ACI uh, at West Point, the, uh, the the Cyber Institute there. Army Cyber Institute. Jan is against hackback. But when I discussed all my ideas with him, he said, hmm, he kind of changed his mind. Look what Jan said. I have now if you look at his published right, you can Google him. You'll see he's anti-hackback. But when I discuss what I'm talking about that I discussed with you today, he kind of had a little change of mind when it relates to the Chinese. I have that in my mind because their worst fear is to lose their face knowing that their only real catastrophe would be social entropy, unrest, and a challenge to the regime. We are all, we are more a sidekick. Also, if they lose the country, it's big enough to do this. Doesn't make sense here. And you have, voila, a civil war. The fact the PLA has never really been to war, okay, got beaten by the NVA in 1979, is also a risk. What happens if they escalate to regional war and lose? The Chinese cannot afford to lose any conflict, okay? They could have regime change. They could have a civil war. More likely than not, it would be one of the other factions would simply take over, and Xi Jinping would be given a nice house. Oh, this is... Uh, beating up on Jeff, um, would be given a, a nice house in Jungnan High, and he would just be retired, and he would never see the 2049 global hegemony. Okay, so these are some of the issues here, and you got to look at what the costs are to the individual country you're dealing with. And now I'm just beating up Jeff here. In May of this year, DEF CON will officially land in China. Do you see the future 2018, the first DEF CON China Baidu Security Industry International Summit was, was co-hosted by DEF CON and Baidu. This is on the DEF CON China website, translated directly in English. And you don't see that, do you? Right? Because you can't read that. Okay? So, again, what are our ethics? What are our morals? How willing are we to engage with certain people, certain regimes at a certain time? Okay, so again, I think we, we need to take the culture, we need to look at, they have more to lose. They have a lot to lose. Uh, and they can be different. I'm not sure about the Iranians or the North Koreans. Okay, that might be a whole different game. The other thing here is one last thing that I'll, I'll end on. China and Russia can't speak to Iran and North Korea. Both of them are offensive realists. If you've read John Mersheimer and read a lot of John Mersheimer, not just his keyboard, read his articles in international security and elsewhere, uh, John Mersheimer, offensive realism, that's kind of what Trump is, but that's what the Russians and the Chinese are. If you're going to think of how the Chinese are going to react, they're already reacting that way in the South China Sea. They're bullying countries. They're doing all sorts of things. That's just the way it is. Remember, they were, the Chinese mindset is they should rule the world. They were the most powerful country throughout history. It's their time to rule again. It's not a world. Okay, we'll probably be second or third class citizens in that world. I don't want that for my children and grandchildren. All right, so questions, uh, please. And I will repeat the questions. I was told to do that. Okay. okay. What are your thoughts on uh, any threats of uh, some other country or some other country? Like, uh, 
That goes to the attribution side. Yeah. So again, again, with, with this kind of a policy, if we're not really sure, we don't do something. Okay? Again, this is like, you know, there's a 3% chance this might be China. Let's hack. Okay, no, it's not like that. So we are looking at, but we're trying to bring in more technology to help with the attribution. It's when we get the attribution and it's pretty sure, then I'm talking about doing something. And if it has to be at a certain level of a hackback, then it's got to get more approvals in the IC or the Pentagon. Okay? This isn't just like, again, wanton hacking. Yeah, uh, Misty. Um, so, Watson has issues with Pentagon. Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Watson is working on that. So Robert High has told me they are working on that. Oh, I'm sorry, repeat the question. Uh, why not use reinforcement learning? I guess that's it. Uh, IBM is working on that. And certainly DARPA has a lot of work on that. So part of this, like I said, would be IBM. Some part of this would be DARPA. It's a combination. Because they're not, they're not really approaching things in the same way. So that would be, let me ask the gentleman right next to you. Yes. yes. Okay, two good questions, and I'll try to repeat them. The first question dealt with, if I can, it's about the idea of hacks against uh, private corporations that are not necessarily defense or aerospace contractors. I guess that's the first question. Pri and I guess a lot of smaller companies as well. And then the second question is, what are the legal issues on all of this? Now, as you know, there's ACDC. And ACDC basically means anybody in this room can hack back. I also think that's a little bit silly. So what I'm really referring to is more the defense. What worries me are the F-35 designs. What worries me is the satellite hacking. What worries me is the submarine warfare plans and our missile strategies, okay, and our missile designs. That's what worries me. It isn't so much the small companies. I agree that's an issue. That's not an issue I'm addressing. Okay, I do, though, agree that is an issue, but that's not an issue I feel I can address at this point. I'm mainly concerned with the contractors, because right now, if they hack the government, our government can hack back, right? Our government can, but what do the contractors do? They're not stealing, st well, they still want to cry from NSA. Oh, we can't say that. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they do, they do hack into our government, like the OPM files and so on, but we have an ability to deal with that. My concern is the F-35 was a Lockheed contractor, right? How do we deal with that? That's who I'm really trying to address with this. It's the contractors. Okay, so just to repeat again, this is about on the War Powers Act, and would this be a violation of it, or is it allowable because we're being attacked? That's a good legal question. I believe Senator Sullivan would lead a charge to changing the law. Okay, but I agree. The way the law exists, I mean, right now, CFAA says you basically can't do anything. ACDC says you can do anything. <laughs> Everybody, is, that's a little bit silly, I think, too. Okay, so we need to have some level of compromise where there is control. DOD and IC sign off at certain escalation levels. Yeah, there is more control. Please. Um, can you, uh, I'm not trying to be accusatory with this question, but um, can you speak to potential conflicts of interest on, on your side when you are talking about the threat from China and talking about their culture and how it means that they're going to take over the world, and then also you're trying to sell services that are going to hack back against China? Um, and then you're also talking about, you know, oh, but, you know, not anyone can do that, just I can do that. Can you just address that? Sure. I'm happy to. So the question was about conflict of interest in general, my personal conflict of interest. I have no, no skin in this. 
I want to see a result. I want to see it try to stop. I want to connect response if we can avoid that. I have nothing in this game, personally. Maybe I will. I, I, now, to be honest, maybe I would at some point. But at this point, I have nothing in this. Um, uh, as a follow-up, can mm -hmm. you talk about a little bit why you don't think that uh, this kind of activity will result in escalations from cyber attacks in China? Oh, absolutely. I'm happy to do that. So the Chinese, oh, so, so the question was about escalation. Why would the Chinese uh, not escalate? Uh, it, they have too much to lose on escalation. Uh, they, if, if we keep on taking this further, there's going to be more problems. They're going to have more to lose ultimately than we could realistically have to lose. They also, again, they don't, they're not ready for a conflict especially if we go kinetic. They're not ready for that. If they lose, oh, so here's the analogy I use. South China Sea conflict. China loses the conflict with us. There's going to be protests. There might be regime change. One of these other factions of the Communist Party may take over. America loses in the South China Sea. And each American looks at each other and says, where's the South China Sea? Okay. The difference in how each country would respond to this situation is a radical difference. That's why the Chinese are scared to death to deal with the Senkaku, the Aru Island situation. If the Chinese lose to the Japanese for a third time, Uh, no, I actually don't. I think that's a misleading uh, idea from a Western media. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Is that uh, will the Chinese uh, start um, getting pissed, basically, at all the facial recognition and surveillance and so on? Actually, I'm not convinced of that. It's just like when Americans talk about democracy. China's never had democracy in 6,000 years. Americans, shut up. They don't want democracy. But what they want is freedom and liberty. That's different than democracy. That's a government. They have no interest in democracy. Okay? So again, we come up with some ideas that are really kind of goofy, that we're imposing our values on them, and it just doesn't fit with their, their history. Freedom of liberty is a different story. Will they actually uh, uh, be upset with their... Possibly, but my guess is most of them will not. Right now, they're already followed on, on uh, WeChat, on uh, QQ, so the two major social networks are already followed. Okay, I want to go ahead with uh, Ben. I was wondering if you could uh, just talk any of your thoughts on what, what would proportional response look like, let's say, for economic espionage, right? Some company gets hit, uh, things are stolen. You know, perhaps we can actually attribute it back to a Chinese actor. What, what would proportional response look like, and, you know, either from your perspective or, or whatever you think the, the senator would have you know, thought? And this is why did we hit that? Well, what would hitting back look like? Okay, so Ben asked, uh, what would be a proportional response if we get a, a hit by the Chinese for economic espionage? I think, excuse me, I think economics is less of an issue, at least to me, than stealing the F-35 designs. Okay, we'll go, we'll go with that. Okay, so we'll go with the F-35 designs. We may have a fairly severe uh, counterattack on that. What it would be, we'll have to see. I mean, we remember, even with the Russians, we talked about uh, releasing uh, Putin's holdings overseas. Okay, all of his money, that's all over the world. We talked about that. Uh, we know that Xi Jinping's brother-in-law has over a billion dollars. We know that from the Panama Papers release. Uh, so we know they didn't, we know the Chinese didn't do the Panama Papers since Xi Jinping's brother-in-law, who must be a, an excellent investor to have over one billion dollars. Um, you know, that's that kind of situation. So that would have to be figured out. And I think that's something that the government would have to figure out what the response would be. But I don't think it's going to be like tit for tat. It's going to be like two oranges and the cone. Because I don't think you can really have tit for tat. Now, do we have their hypersonic missile designs? I pray to God we do. Okay, but I don't know if we do. Okay, I don't know if we do. But they don't have a lot of technology we want to steal at this point. So that's another problem. I mean, what do we do? So we're gonna, what do we steal? Okay, the hypersonic missile might be the one thing. Carlos. Hey, hey, how do you, 
balance the alarmist presentation that this could be categorized in. Sitting in many of these talks and many conferences, you get different perspectives. In one talk here, we heard about spying and the different relationships between everybody. And the conclusion was, they are all swingers. Because what else could it be? What you should have demonstrated on the cameras in China could be said in Europe, could be said in New York City, could be said in most metropolitan areas that are up and coming. The conclusions don't necessarily follow. You know, correlation, causation, I, I Okay, I let me. A okay. I know some of those people, and I don't. I think they might have been taken out of context. Okay, so Carlos asked about uh, with the surveillance and such. Uh, we have, or at least London, I believe, has the most cameras of any city in the world per per square kilometer or something. Uh, the difference is, last time I checked, and this is what I want Rob Joyce to tell people when he gets asked this question, because DT, when he was asked about DefCon China, said, "Well, you know, the NSA does it." Bullshit. The NSA doesn't do that. I haven't seen any score report. My FICO score is not being impacted because I have a friend that has orange hair. Okay, that's a fundamental difference. Remember, with the, what's going to happen here, I also thought this was funny when I saw this. I thought, oh my God, hackers. How are hackers going to be involved? They have enough trouble getting dates as it is. Now they're going to get less dates on a dating app. They won't be able to travel. That's what's going to happen in China. You can't use a train. You can't use a plane. And I think the slow internet would be the worst thing for hackers, right? Yeah, you, you, you mentioned a particular sect that was being targeted. That's the stretch. That's the giant leap that may not follow what, what you just presented. Okay, so you're talking about the Uyghurs, yes. okay, in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, which is an autonomous region, not a province in China. Uh, that is a little bit extreme. I realize what they're doing is a little bit extreme there. The follow-on video it applies to everybody, the credit score video. And last time, like I said, the NSA isn't telling, your FICO scores are not impacted by your friend with orange hair. Okay, we're even joking, people are joking in China that if you buy a Snickers bar because it's not healthy, it will fractionally reduce your credit score. I mean, to the point that this is a great way to control your population, right? Okay, this basically, this is Pavlovian conditioning. You do something we don't like, smack on the nose. You can't travel. Yeah, may, may, maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, what well, we have one question here for. I actually have one question. His question on the social credit score is supposed to be open by the media, but the book is. There is, in fact, no kind of credit rating system in China by traditional financial means. And so the idea that everybody's being rated, again, the Uyghurs are different things. Uyghurs are clearly being targets. He's not sure that this is actually why the threat is the weapon he was making it out to be. That's uh, probably worse. Jeff knows nothing about China. Oh, this is about the uh, this is about the the credit score. Is it a reality or not? Uh, Jeff knows nothing about China. Okay, uh, Jeff is yeah. He is you know the thing is about China. China is a lived experience. You can't read about China. You have to experience China. I tell people when I fly back to China, I go through a wormhole and I land on a different planet. With even the laws of physics. Are Okay, I could tell you so many stories for weeks on end about things in China. It's really very different. As an executive in one in the two of the largest IT firms and so on, at law and so on. So at very different levels in China. In the village level, my girlfriend, fiance, whatever she is, uh, she's from a village where they actually slept around the oven to keep warm in the winter. They had an outhouse and a stable for a horse or a cow. This is the real China. That's the China Beijing fears. They don't fear the Beijingers and Shanghainese with money. They can control them. They might even let them leave. But it's the, it's the remember, China's history is one of peasant revolt. That's the fear. Joe. So, um, so I've, I've got, you know, it's interesting seeing from China's perspective, my experience is more on the Russian side, mm -hmm. Do you think that we're in a situation where with China, 
that we are actually in a situation where we actually have better attribution showing where it's coming from. I know there is differences, but in Russia you've got both nascent state actors and uh, mercenaries and cyber crime is happening. Uh, do we have those differences in China as well? Where we're actually clearly determined, is it nascent state, is it mercenaries or cyber crime? So that's a good question. And the question from, from, uh, from Joe was, uh, can we do the attribution effectively with China? Okay, and to sum it up, uh, that's a good question. And that's a question I don't, you know, I think Rob Joyce can answer that question. Uh, that's a good question. That is an issue, though. But think about this. And here's what I want to remind everybody. Think of the FireEye Mandiant turning on the cameras in the PLA unit, looking at them, looking at porn. Now, that's FireEye. That's Kevin Mandiant. Okay. okay. I would hope the NSA has better. But I don't know. We, we, my understanding is that, that the Chinese are not smarter about it, but I would also expect that the NSA is a lot better than FireEye. Otherwise, FireEye should own the industry, right? Okay. Everybody should just buy FireEye. So my guess is we do have better capability, but I, I don't know. You'd have to ask uh, Rob that. Please. Yeah, so I have a question. Um, so talking about the, the hackback thing and mainly being less than kinetic in response, um, when we're talking about like effects in cyberspace and tradecraft and TTPs, do you think the trade-off is worth it by potentially using what we do have if we do have implants in China, Russia, whatever, um, sort of tipping our hat to those instead of using some sort of economic sanction if we're really trying to get after, you know, Okay, so the question was, would sanctions be uh, perhaps a better alternative than actually hacking back? Summarize your question. Okay, okay that's a good question. And that's and we don't know. And I think that's a policy decision. My idea is that we have hack back in place to do it, and whether we want to do economic sanctions is another issue. But economic sanctions, we know two things. One, they tend to take oh five minutes. Okay, we tend to take a long time with economic sanctions to actually take effect. The other problem is they do tend to affect a lot of people in the country. So many more Chinese would get impacted by economic sanctions than by a hackback. I mean, assuming it's, you know, like an F-35, we're not going to shut down the grid in Shandong province or some other huge province with 100 million people, okay? So, again, trying to do something that's relatively proportional, I would think it would affect less Chinese people, but send a message and also cause disruption. You know, the worst thing would be everything in China, China, you don't use money, basically. You use Alipay and you use Weishi Pay, WeChat Pay. And if you shut down that, the Chinese would be so pissed. When you buy vegetables from the old lady on the street, you're paying her with your phone. Shut that down. You'll piss off a lot of people. <laughs> oh, let's go to the back. Let's. So, in the same way that American defense companies don't sell current generation weapons to countries to anything other than our own services, you could argue that the weapons in this kind of cyber war are the research that American and Western universities are out there. Do we need some sort of arms control? Now, you, you kind of hinted at this field in academia. <laughs> So I'm not sure I understand your question. So should we be limiting American universities? Oh, that's a great question. Should, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So do we limit, let's say, Chinese students, grad students in the United States with access to this, uh, this kind of research? I believe absolutely. That's a totally different talk, and I can talk about that for weeks on end, too. But uh, yes, that is a big issue, and it's a problem, and I'm trying to actually deal with that issue with Chinese students in America. But they really don't want to touch it. So that's a problem. I mean, okay, I'll give you the short answer on how to deal with Chinese students spying in America. It's real simple. Three o'clock in the morning, FBI SWAT team goes in. Six students, four guys, two girls. Two of the guys are members of the party. One of the girls is. You bust them in, high profile, video, arrest them for espionage. Don't let them out. The spying by the Chinese students will stop. Okay, it will totally stop. A lot of the students in China that are the Chinese that are in America, they don't want to spy. They're pressured by the government. If they're going to go to jail, they've got a reason not to spy. That would actually, I think many Chinese students would be almost happy by that because it gets them out of the pressure of spying. And then they can just enjoy learning. Okay, not pressure. So that's an excellent question, but that, again, I can go on. Yeah. 
Go ahead, uh, Missy. One more question. Okay. Yeah, that's what that's what NSA would have to decide. I mean, that's not for me to decide. That's what NSA would have to decide. What are they willing to accept? DIA, NSA, DOD, the White House, or the White House Cyber Advisor? Oh, we don't have one of those anymore. Um, they would have to make that decision as to what it would be. My understanding is that attribution is a lot better than people in this community believe. Okay? If you really pin down Rob Joyce, attribution is a lot better than what we're led to believe. I mean, think about that. Fire eye, turn on the camera, the guys who are actually naming the... Indi Look what happened to the Russians that, that we just indicted last month by name. Attribution's not as big of an issue as we think. But I think a lot of that's secret, so we don't know. And I think it needs to remain secret. Thank you very much. If you have any comments, or please, I love your feedback. To get a good, bad, obviously one thing is this was too long for my Air Force talk because I only have 45 minutes for the Air Force. So that's one thing. Oh, Schwack, best questions. Let's see. Uh, actually, I like, the, uh, I like the question about the school. So here's your Chinese USB stick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we can get back to him. Yeah. Oh, you got it? Okay. Let's see. Don't go kinetic, David. Don't go kinetic. Carlos, I like your question too. Okay? And that was too far. <laughs> that, was, that was more aerodynamic. It was heavier. All right. So if you have any questions or anything, want to talk about it, it's my big headache, and I'm happy to talk about it. And thank you for being here today.